So our next discussion is going to be about the big issue of the day, really, which is, are we on track to meet a two-degree target by the end of this century? Um, and I'm going to put a question to the panelists, which they don't know I'm going to put, so it's not a fix. Okay, and I'm going to say to them they have only one word to answer this question. Okay, and then I want you all to think about it, so we can just test the temperature of the room. Then what I'd like to do is to use our expert group, please, to be the questioners for our panel. And I'm hoping that my role would simply be to move on from subject to subject. So the expertise is in the room. Let's use it to engage with our panelists. Um, and let's hear from the audience as well. And audience, I'm going to throw the ball to you as we're going along. So don't fall asleep at the back, please. These people don't need any introduction. Here's Professor Cherubini, the, the paradox man. <laughs> yes? Yeah. We might go to the Maldives instead of driving less. Okay, we have Leif Hovum, who was bold enough to make forecasts, so not just scenarios. We have um, Gunnar Lodera from PIC. We have uh, oh, the great champion of <laughs> H2 and CCS, Irena Romohov from Stator. And at the very end is someone who does need an introduction, and that's Volker Krai from IASA. Okay, so the question I'm going to ask them all, which they don't know I'm going to ask them, is yes or no answers. Are we on track, then, for this two-degree goal? Yes or no? So let's start with, who should we start with? Oh, you're the forecaster, so let's start yeah, with Leif Hover. I think I already answered, actually. Um, what our forecast... Was that a yes or no? It's no, we're not on the right Okay, path. no. We will We've not, got a no. If we continue on the current path, we will not reach the Paris Agreement. Okay. That's what I was beginning to fear. Mm. Very worrying. Um, Volker, yes or no? No. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. But it's not hopeless. Yes. Okay, and that's what the rest of the discussion is, but then where do, how do we make it happen? Um, Irena? No. Oh Lord, this is getting very gloomy. Um, <laughs> Professor Carabini, you can, you can say yes for us, I would you? like to add some spice. One <laughs> word answer. No. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Gunnar? Clear now. Oh, well, what, what, what does the room think? Those who, who think yes, let's go that way, then I can see you. Those who think yes, we can do it, we can do it. Put your hands up, please. I'm the only one in the room? Someone at the back? Okay, so this discussion is about how do we get from where we are now, which is kind of pessimistic, to where we want to be in a realistic, um, affordable, committed, um, practical way, yeah? And I'd like to start this discussion by moving to the expert group to put questions about that very point. What do we need to do now? Ah, I see distinguished Professor Williams has her card up. Um, can you get us going, please, Professor Williams? So I, I would just like to raise a question from a very pragmatic point of view. It's clear that Paris is a starting point. It's helping us start to define some uh, incentives and intentions, but we all agree, but by itself, it's not enough. But from a pragmatic point of view, how are we actually thinking in these scenarios, which do change the future, or these projections, which do change the future, what makes a difference? So I'd like to ask um, Johannes Truby. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you do not use a carbon price in your projections, uh, but you also brought forward issues of social justice, uh, universal access to uh, electricity and clean air as potent drivers. So one question is, how do those then fold into what makes your scenario work? And then a question for Irina. Uh, you had mentioned, which I fully agree with, the importance and the difficulties of working at the scale of the energy system, how big companies can do that. But even if we get uh, to the scale of one, say, hydrogen plant that can displace two million cars, we have a billion cars that we actually need to displace the emissions from. How does it happen that we then make that transition to get to the scale big enough to have the impacts that we would really like to have? Uh, Johannes first, I think. Johannes is not here. Johannes not there. Ah, sorry. Thank <laughs> you. Gunnar, was it, was your first, who was your first question to? Well, Hello. actually, yeah. In, these, uh, in the scenarios that I presented, carbon price is really the central policy entry point to uh, making this transition happen. And it's, 
it's obvious if you want to go to zero emissions economy, you really have to look at all the sectors and you need policies to address all these sectors. So um, there are examples of carbon pricing systems uh, in Europe, for example. Uh, they are still relatively weak, but it's also possible to fix them in a way um, that makes them more effective. And, uh, and the single most, uh, the single easiest lever is to establish something like a price floor in these systems. For example, to say uh, this, the CO2 price in the EU emissions trading system uh, will, all, will be guaranteed not to get lower than 30, 30 euros per ton of CO2. Um, and this would clear, make clear incentives for the investors and then also trigger a lot more transitions than we actually see currently. So this is um, yeah, one of these uh, very, very effective entry points. And is it actually going to happen? Is there other moves to, to change the system in this way? Pardon me? Is there, are there moves to, to reform the system in this way? Is it likely but to this happen? Is like, this is um, discussed in the real policy arena. There is a lot of reluctance and uh, due to the institutional uh, setup of, of the EU, it's not, it's not easy to make it happen. Uh, but there are initiatives also on the, on the national level. Like France is considering this. Uh, President Macron has uh, put a similar proposal on the table. Uh, there are plans for carbon prices or carbon price floors uh, in the UK, so this, is, this goes into the right direction. Volker Kreij, how do you see the importance of trying to put a carbon price into the system, or are there other ways in which we can try and achieve goals without it? Um, my impression is that we will need um, differentiated policy mechanisms for, for different sectors. I mean, if you look at um, the transport sector in particular that uh, Francesco uh, told us about. I mean, the implied carbon price in existing fuel taxes in European countries, and Norway is, is spearheading that, is in the, in the ballpark of 300 to, to 500 dollars per ton CO2 if you just convert the fuel tax into an implicit carbon tax. And that shows you that even a very substantial carbon tax will not be sufficient to, to really um, in, induce a transition in, in these sectors. However, there are under other sectors um, where even uh, much more modest carbon prices um, can be expected to have a, a more fundamental shift as they, as they really um, change the competitiveness of, of the technology options on the table. My hunch is that um, while an emissions trading uh, system which tries to control um, the quantity, so the overall emissions, is nice from a policy perspective, but it lacks the, um, yeah, from an investor's perspective, it, it lacks the uh, security about, um, I mean, how, how are costs and competitiveness uh, <coughs> going to evolve in the future? So maybe as an alternative, we should, um, we should think about uh, carbon taxing rather than a quantity-based mechanism to yeah, to have a, essentially a guaranteed price that, that companies can then work with. But I suppose our um, company representatives on the panel uh, will be able to say more whether that, mec uh, that type of instrument is more preferable from a business perspective. Well, why don't you pick up on that, Irena, as well as Professor Williams' question? Well, I, I certainly think CO2 pricing is important to, for the, and probably the most efficient tool to make the transition go quicker. But I think it's more than that. And we're seeing in many countries now, solar and wind is the cheapest source of electricity anyway. So you don't need uh, you know, the CO2 price to incentivize it. And, and me and my team, we're out there every day chasing these opportunities to develop solar and wind projects. But competition is very, very fierce. So there's not enough project today. And I think the reason is that the governments need help to put in place the frameworks, not subsidies, because it's not needed anymore. So we need to know how to access land. We need to know how to secure the environmental permits. We need to know how we can access the grid and so on. So that's need to be put in place. And then there is certainly money out there willing to invest in very in affordable uh, energy. So I. That's, um, you know, the biggest um, roadblock these days in my mind. I think we're getting help from maybe an unexpected source uh, when it comes to pushing the energy 
transition, and um, that's the financial sector. And I think it's extremely important, and we're feeling it every day. Our investors are asking more and more for low-carbon solutions. I meet, uh, I talk to a lot of our investors, and every time you know, I meet another investor that has said, well, I have this portfolio investments, I need the CO2 emissions to come down on my portfolio. So if you don't get you know, your emissions under control and start reducing them, I need to drop you from my portfolio. I meet investors out there saying, basically, I can only invest in companies with a certain rating on a sustainability. And that's, that's money that talks, and that's extremely important for the private industry. And I think a lot of you know, the oil and gas companies, but certainly the coal companies and other, you know, are feeling this pressure, and it's extremely uh, strong. That's a really interesting point, and maybe that's an essential ingredient in moving things along. Askar, next year, make sure you have more investors in the room, huh? So let's have some more questions around this theme. We haven't heard from Anders Stroman yet. Um, what more needs to be done? Well, thanks a lot for very interesting presentations and good discussions. I, I want to bring up a bit the land issue, uh, which we touched upon previously. So clearly, um, reaching the one and a half or two degree targets is very dependent on, or seemingly uh, dependent on, uh, strongly land-related mitigation options. And my question to you then, I guess it goes to, uh, to Gunnar Fokker and Francesco mainly is, um, how do you see that we should maneuver going forward on this? Because the general perception now is that biofuels are a bit bad. At the same time, we see deep and long-term mitigation options seem quite dependent on land <clears throat> use. And, and the question is, how do we then advise policymakers to move forward on this uh, today now? Uh, and how do we sort of resolve this conundrum? So, any of you, please. Francesco. I think this is a, a key point for the next few years that we need, we need to solve. At the end, is a puzzle where all the pieces need to come together. I would like to bring another uh, perspective to the discussion that we only briefly touch upon, which is urgency, right? So we, we, need, we need, actually, there is this, the so-called closing door of climate targets. So the more we wait, the less chances we have to achieve stabilization of, of, of temperature target to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. There is this uh, great effort from the PCC towards this special report on the 1.5 <coughs> degrees target, and many people think it's actually a sort of waste of time because that's complete, the door is almost closed. So, so, so as somebody who is not part of this world, I would say that in general out there, um, people feel, well, we've made huge strides. Look at this renewable solar PV. It's all, you know, China will come to the rescue. We really don't have to worry. Yes? So when you say we need urgency, I'm thinking, in what area? What, what is it that we urgently need to do? Well, there are, there are some aspects that, that, that we know that is, is this linearity of global warming with cumulative carbon emissions. And we need to achieve this decarbonization in the different sectors. And the point that was made by Andes before is that we, we have this, this clear message from the, the large scenarios that um, Gunnar and colleagues are running that we need to increase the demand of products that we have from our land. But the point is that now we are in the phase where we still see some unhomogeneous outcomes from scientific literature, especially from large-scale studies, from top-down approaches and bottom-up studies, which are more narrowed down in terms of biosource capacity because of the different constraints that you have and trade-offs and interlinkages with the other demands that you have from the land, which are difficult to reconcile. So it is, in order to solve this puzzle, this puzzle, we need to take the problems from a different angle, to reduce energy consumption, to have changes in diets, because the, the majority of the land we are using today in, in our planet is for, for pasture. So we are actually using our land to feed animals and not people. So it's, and, and I myself eating meat first, so I'm not doing this because I have something. It, 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 it's a matter of fact. So we, we need to rethink, to have transitions in the different sectors of, of the economy in order to make sure that we have enough resources to, to, make, to meet the objectives that we have. And the point of urgency is important because the more we, we delay with taking actions, the more we have the need to rely on negative emissions, which are quite uncertain by the end of the century on the, on the second half 
of the 21st centuries. So even the inaction has a cost. So this is, should be clear. Sometimes we have a negative approach toward taking actions because we have some, some side effects or trade-offs. But also the inaction has a cost for ecosystem services, for food prices, for climate change, for a variety of things. Leave. what do you think needs urgently to be tackled? Sorry? I'm just asking you, yeah, yeah. Leave Hove, I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> Well, I think there is a risk that uh, one can sit and wait so long for the perfect solution. For, for example, everything is renewable, that uh, we forget to uptake existing technologies that actually will improve the situation. For example, transport, uh, heavy, heavy goods transport, use gas for that instead of waiting for the electrical truck. So to start uh, the uptake of existing technology on the journey towards uh, the zero carbon future, I think that's urgent. I have to say I'm completely shocked that biofuels are such an important part of this discussion. I mean, until last night, I didn't even think about it as being an important part of this transition, that, that discussion, debate that you're having. And I, I'm not sure that outside this room, necessarily, people would, would, um, are, are, are with you on that. So can I just test the temperature in the room? Do you, do you agree with what uh, we've just heard from Gunnar? That, that, that there is such centrality in this issue of, of biofuels, as he was saying. I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Gunnar. It's just my own prejudice, really. So can, can we have a show of hands for yes? There's someone there. Yeah, there are a few. Mm -hmm. There are a few. Sorry, my eyesight isn't so good, so I'm going to go right into you. But I think you're mostly in the minority, actually. This whole side of the room, no one's put their hand. Well, Professor Williams has a whole <coughs> hand up. Aha, uh -huh. and we also have... Okay, Jay Edmonds. So let's say 10% if we're being generous, maybe 15 at most. Are we, so it's interesting that what, what people feel about that. Okay, um, I think, um, I I think just, Irana wanted to I just something. wanted to address the, the topic of land use. Um, I do think we have enough land for, for solar and wind at least to, to, to really uh, grow. But there is the NIMBY issue. People don't want to see them, they don't want to hear it, and, and, and it's something that we just need to face. But the, the simple solution is to move, move offshore. And that's why we're excited about offshore wind. And with the introduction of floating offshore wind, we open up uh, five times as much acreage or area uh, to exploit uh, and the biggest, best wind resources. So uh, I think that's a, definitely an unexploited area. Cost. But that sort of makes sense for Stadtoil, and that makes sense no. for Norway. Is no. that really an answer no, no. for it, it does the whole not, problem? It does not make sense to Norway. Uh, okay. We have 100% coverage with hydropower, uh, okay. cheaper than offshore wind. But what we have proved over the last couple of years is that offshore wind is now competitive with all other technologies. Okay. And Stadtoil, we put in a bid for the first unsubsidized offshore wind farm in the Netherlands. Uh, hoping to, to get some good feedback on that one. Uh, so it just tells you that uh, if someone is willing to stick their, stick their neck out, um, subsidize it for a few years, technology will mature, costs will come down, and uh, now offshore wind is a very, very good solution for many, many markets. Okay, is the room as confident as Irena about that? Yes, there are lots of nodding heads here. Can we have a show of hands? Oh, far more hands going up, okay. So then what's the, what are the barriers then? Why, why, why is, um, is it uh, government, more government money you need? What are, what are indus why is industry lagging? Yes? If I may chime in here, I, I uh, really want to be, uh, <laughs> uh, um, put a bit of uh, water into the way. I, I re I'm really quite enthusiastic about the potentials of wind and solar for, um, uh, for mitigation. At the same time, we have to keep in mind that more than half of our emissions really come from non-electric energy users. So really, transport is a sure. big issue, industry is a big issue, in Europe housing is a huge issue, and the, like, even though renewables have taken off the way they have over the last 10 years, this is not, this is not going to, solve, to, to, to save us. We really, we have such big challenges at hand, even if we uh, sustain the growth that we had in PV, and in wind, there's still so much very, very cheap coal out there. And getting rid of that coal needs extra. You, don't, you not only need incentives to get the new stuff in, you also need some kind of approaches, disincentives to get the old, dirty fossil stuff out. Otherwise, you will never get to these near zero emissions economies. Second, you really have to think about non-electric energy supplies, or energy demands. So, um, and there you need quite 
ambitious, transformative changes on the demand side. Electric vehicles, um, they have niche markets. We are talking currently about, uh, as we heard, uh, around a million cars, um, electric cars that, that, that are on the roads. At the same time, 99 point something percent are still conventional cars, and this is a huge issue, and it will take very, very dedicated interventions to really have, uh, have transformative changes there as well. So wind and solar alone, alone will not save us. We really, really need to think very, very hard about how to get um, these other 60 or 70 percent of emissions from non-electric energy uses uh, to get to these near zero emissions that we need to get to, to be anywhere close to 1.5 degree or, two, or even 2 degree world. Oh man, I'm sure we, all, we don't need to do a, a show of hands for that, right? Um, Volker. Yeah, I would, I would argue that um, one of the entry points for moving towards two or even one and a half degrees is the demand side. Um, by being successful um, with the transformation on the demand side, you, you actually, I mean, that, that is the one leverage that we have to reduce, for example, the impact on land and the reliance on, on bioenergy. Um, there's also a lot of studies uh, out there now that emphasize that the demand side measures are typically those that have the most co-benefits in, in many, many other dimensions, in, including air pollution, including, um, yeah, a, a, a wide variety, energy security is, is one of them, a wide, wide variety of, um, of positive non-climate benefits that materialize. The challenge is equally large. Um, we have recently done a study where we kind of systematically scanned the literature for um, yeah, for those type of technologies that enable demand side tra uh, transitions, they have the benefit, I think this came up earlier in the discussions, these technologies are more granular, so they can usually be scaled up much faster. I mean, think of mobile phones or of, of, of solar PV, they are mass manufactured. Um, and, I mean, when we can depict the transition that even does not require um, large amounts of bioenergy in combination, for instance, with CCS, and still get us to one and a half degrees. But the challenge over the next, next 15 years is enormous, and it will interfere strongly with our lifestyles. It would require a massive rollout of, of retrofits of buildings. We should probably all fly much less than we, we, we do. I mean, I'm just looking at the audience, I suppose some of the people did come by plane, and there are few options out there other than biofuels at the moment to mitigate those emissions. So the challenge is, is a big one. So shall we move on to how do we change our behaviors, in what areas, what are the, what are the things we can do to try and hasten on this, this process? Would someone like to, to, to start us with a question on that, Francis? I'd like to not just yet, because I think there's something really important that hasn't been addressed by, by the panel. Go on. The challenge of meeting two degrees or three degrees, for that matter, is not in what we do in Europe or in the United States. It's what happens in Asia, what happens in India, what happens in China. And we're having a discussion here that I think is very interesting. <coughs> it's very focused in this part of the world, and that's useful, of course. But the winning or losing of this battle, and certainly any effort to kind of lock in at two degrees, will be won and lost in those markets. Um, so we saw some interesting projections this morning, scenarios and so on, but they were scenarios. When you actually step back and you look at some of the baseline projections from, from, uh, from many of the agencies that we have today, they're showing a lot of growth in things like wind and solar, but we're not seeing a reduction in, in emissions from many of these other sources. So my question to the panel is, how are we going to address the challenge in those regions, where, frankly, there are other very meaningful issues beyond the questions that we have the luxury of focusing on here in Europe or in Asia, or, uh, or in the United States? How are we going to overcome those? How do we deliver solutions that work in those parts of the world? Because I don't, if we don't, I don't think we can achieve what we're discussing here. Who wants to bite on that? Go for it, Irena. I can go. I think electricity in general is key for emerging market. That's what is going to happen. People are going to use electricity for transport. They're going to use electricity for heating and so on. So you need to, to solve the electricity question. Uh, and I think what I alluded to earlier, um, there is a huge 
willingness from investors like ourselves and others to invest if only the, the projects are there. So, uh, uh, and, and then again, it's access to land, and not land use, but the land rights and, and so on. Um, but you need to solve also the intermittency issue uh, because it is not always blowing and, and sunny. And, and that's where potential gas come in or clean gas in the form of hydrogen or you need or batteries. So that's to me the most critical issue. How do you solve uh, for the intermittency in those markets? And does anyone in the expert group want to speak to Francis's question? I mean, how do we? Yes? Do you want to answer your own question, Francis? No, no, I'd like Jay's opinion on this, actually. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jay, where are you? Can I get a mic to you? You know, you're sitting in the wrong place. Here you go. <laughs> That's very... Uh... It's on, it's on. So it's, it's very common for me to be in the wrong place. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, Francis. I think that there are really uh, two issues. One is how, how do you create an environment in which you can achieve these uh, economic growth and prosperity goals while at the same time uh, reducing emissions uh, literally, uh, not relatively, but absolutely. And I think that's really, really important. And I think it also raises the second question, which is that we focus now on the uh, energy and carbon component of the challenge. And that's because the energy and carbon component is the biggest single part of our emission stream. It's huge. As that gets decarbonized, and we've seen pathways that are feasible to decarbonize the energy system, uh, you are left with the really hard parts of the problem, which is that we've seen this morning, there's no path to two degrees that doesn't fundamentally and revolutionize the use of land, not on the scale of how much land do I need to put wind turbines on or solar arrays, but how much land do I need to grow the new forest that absorb the carbon that isn't being taken up because you've got non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions and deliver the bioenergy and how do you do, what's a policy or measure that will allow you to do that and not drive land rents up that in turn drive food prices up? I think that's an enormous challenge out there. I don't think I answered the question, but I think it's a hard question. Yes, yes, and that's a real shocker, I have to say, and I don't think people are really addressing it, engaging in it. Um, so now, if you don't mind, we're going to move on, Francis, with your permission. Um, to ask about, um, so what, what, what are the behavioral changes that are required? And it's sort of part of the global point that Jay just made. Um, can, I, can I ask Frida Wollenbrua from NTNU to put her question? Actually, you don't need this one, sorry. Why don't you just use the mic you've got? Now it's on? Now you can hear me? Okay. Um, I think... My question is rather, um, I've been kind of thinking about this uh, since uh, Gunnar presented this morning, and a lot of the issues that have been addressed so far has been on uh, wind farm, solar, how can we deal with these issues on a larger scale? Uh, and I think we have to go down to the consumers and to the person sitting at, how, at home in their couch and. Uh, looking at this because I think most people they think well how can we uh, affect this this is just big politician questions these are big companies that need to solve but we also need to look at how can we affect the consumers how can we make them use less energy um, and one question that I kind of had I don't know if it would go to Gunnar or to Francesco but um, if every one of us decided to use a little less energy. We waste less food, spend a couple of hour, a couple of minutes less in the shower each day, take the bus rather than drive our cars, um, take all those little steps. How much would that actually contribute? And I'm, we should ask that question to Johannes Truby as well. So I don't know if you were listening to it, Johannes, but if everybody 
decided to use a tiny bit less, marginally less energy, what difference would that make to the big, big problem and the big issue? Um, maybe we should ask the, the scenario man to go first, which is good now. And then why don't we ask the forecaster to go next, which is Leif. So <clears throat> we looked into that, the role of lifestyle changes. Um, and what we find is um, lifestyle changes are not a substitute for all the other heavy measures. So you really, you can think of it as emissions being um, determined by the amount of energy you need or you consume times the amount of carbon per unit of energy that you consume. So it's helpful to have less energy, but it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't um, uh, erase the need to go to zero carbon uh, energy supply at <coughs> the end. So um, what we see is it's helpful. It doesn't, you still have to decarbonize your energy supply and, and, and uh, do these other transformative changes, but it really reduces these harsh trade-offs that we see between decarbonization and other sustainability goals. For example, the extent to which you rely on biomass will be greatly reduced if you are in these low energy demand, low material demand, sustainable lifestyle worlds. And this is, this is why it's so impo important to get, get people involved and create awareness for, yeah, for these Yeah, climates. so it softens the trade off and maybe buys yeah, you a right. bit of time. Um, Liv? Yeah, so we have also discussed a lot uh, about this um, yeah, human behavior and the uh, rebound effect. And um, what we ended up with this, in this year forecast is that there are uncertainties and there are um, elements that drives the behavior or the effect of the behavior one way and others that goes the other way. For example, we tend to want to reduce our electricity bill, so we uh, put in more insulation, but still we may want to have an extra refriger refrigerator for our beer in the summer, these things. But, so we have ended up that these cancel each other. It doesn't really affect the forecast as we see it now. So it's bigger things, as you said, that actually have to, to drive the, the gap between where we are going and uh, what we want to achieve. So I think Mariana Rieghauger has also done quite a lot of work around this area. Would you like to put the next question? Yes, I, I wanted to follow up on uh, the point of lifestyle changes and push again a, a little bit on what he actually means by that. It's, it's easy to talk about and it's often used as a buzzword, but when it comes to um, changing lifestyles, that's when it really gets hard. And also politically, it's one of the most difficult things to actually achieve. Um, so could you actually elaborate a bit more on what you actually mean by lifestyle changes? Is it flying less? What kind of policies do we really need? Yeah, it's, um, it's helpful to, uh, in answering these questions to consider like these areas where emissions are hardest to avoid. And um, um, interestingly, outside of the energy sector, there's one huge contribution, um, and that is agriculture and uh, methane or nitrous oxide emissions from for example, from, uh, from cultivating ca cattle. So uh, reducing these emissions would greatly pr provide su substantial leeway. Uh, so switching more to a more uh, vegetarian diet or, or reducing the amount of meat consumption, especially uh, beef, really, really makes a major difference. So this is one very concrete example. Um, and this is something where everyone can con contribute, of course. Um, then on the... Um, on the energy side, again, we can think of the areas where it's really hardest to squeeze out the last bit of carbon from the system. And this is clearly transportation. Um, and there it's uh, light duty vehicles, passenger uh, traffic, uh, to the extent that's not electrified, reducing, uh, yeah, reducing those demands uh, is very helpful. And then it's freight and aviation, which also make a big, uh, a big difference. So, um, thirdly, it's industry, and this is closely related to this, uh, to, to, to the to the freight. So the amount of material that we that we kind of uh, funnel through the system, this entire metabolism, essentially scales with the amount of material that we consume. Uh, so thinking about uh, more reusing, more recycling, uh, maybe living in, in 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 smaller dwellings, these kind of things definitely help. So it's it's really. Essentially, it scales with the, uh, yeah, with the amount of material that people consume. Volker Krai, you want to speak to that as well? What? Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, actually, I wanted to bring back the, the dimension that Francis had, uh, had highlighted, and that is, um, I mean, consumer side there also plays a role, but, but getting also uh, developing uh, countries and emerging economies uh, on board. I mean, ultimately, we will only 
uh, reach the two or one and a half degree target if we all agree that we should achieve it. And we certainly will only agree if, um, if we see a benefit in doing so. So inclusiveness, I think, is, is uh, one of the uh, important aspects here. So looking at, at options and solutions for developing countries that um, don't take um, the, the development space um, away, so that allow them to develop, which is on the other hand also um, a protection um, when it comes to climate change that we have already committed to, to adapt to it, right? So um, finding kind of a more uh, sustainable development solution rather than having a narrow focus on climate and decarbonization strategies is I think absolute key so that poor households are for instance not suffering from food price increases due to um, biofuel production um, yeah, and there are many other aspects along those lines. Thank you for broadening it out, Volker. And next year, we have to have more Indians and Chinese in the room. Mm -hmm. OK, so but before, before the panel, the expert group totally dominate the questions, is there anyone in the audience who would like the green magic box? Yes, great, excellent. Hi, so this, one's, uh, this one goes to Irene Ramlov. So you were focusing on offshore wind parks, but uh, another question or another thing we have to take into consideration is enhancing the grids. Uh, there was an offshore wind park in north, uh, northern Germany called Rifgat, who, which uh, consumed 22,000 liters of diesel uh, before, uh, before it could, um, could provide uh, or produce energy, and uh, I think it went on for like one year, because the necessary grid, uh, uh, the grid wasn't um, ready. You ready? Yeah. So, don't you think, or do you think that uh, the power grids are ready for uh, building more wind parks? Well, I think you're pointing to something very important, and um, developing the grid uh, is extremely. Um, necessary and to meet this energy transition and I don't think necessarily people understand how much investment that needs to go into grid. Uh, we looked at the Netherlands for instance and if we want to electrify everything that they're using gas for in the heat segment these days we need to nine double the investment in the grid uh, compared to today. So it's going to be extremely costly. Uh, it's also going to be very difficult logistically to develop that kind of uh, uh, services. But we're also seeing a lot of innovation when it comes to grid, how we can better use the grid by introducing frequency uh, support by in introducing sensors on the power lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it is an area where we're seeing tremendous amount of innovation uh, and a lot of potential. But a very good point. A ninefold increase in investment is massive, um, which I hadn't been aware of. Robert Reich, uh, has been waiting very. Ritz has been waiting very patiently with his um, with his card up, and I, your time has come now, Robert. I just wanted to uh, push the panel a, uh, a can little... Can we hear him? Can we hear him? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, now I can even hear myself. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to push the panel a little bit more on the policy side of this. And in particular, what do you think that policymakers should be doing differently relative to what is already being done today? Um, I'm very persuaded, for example, that the transport sector is particularly difficult to decarbonize. Um, I think it's worth remembering that um, uh, following a, an agreement essentially brokered by the United Nations and the International Civil Aviation Authority in 2016, there are already plans for what is um, at least a kind of carbon pricing scheme to get started for aviation globally in the early 2020s, and there's a sort of parallel uh, policy dynamic in shipping. Um, and I'm sort of wondering what, um, and these initiatives are global, um, what do the panelists make of those? And are there any other areas where uh, you think change is needed on the policy front to support these various technologies? 
um, Francesco Carabini? Uh, yes, I think this is the critical point because then at the end you need to make those things happen, right? And those things can make our policymakers, our decision makers, then, then can try to, to have this guidance through the transition. And this is difficult to, to establish now because it, at the end it's a matter of find, finding the proper instruments and policies that can work. If you take the example of the Paris Agreement, it was seen as a great success to have this international agreement to limit two degrees or even less, 1.5. But then if you, if you look at the NDCs that uh, Gunnar showed before, we, they are enough to stabilize CO2 emissions, not to go deep down. So those type of, of issues, I think, should be, have a better harmonization on what is actually needed, the urgency of the challenge, and what are the policy measures that can deliver. But also to follow up on, on Volker, we should not only take those things are, are, as challenges and negative side effects. There are also positive effects. There are options that can co-deliver across different uh, sustainable development goals, different alternatives, and perhaps those can help policymakers and decision makers to have this broader view on, uh, on the different instruments and policies that are taken that can help not only climate change, but all, also with air pollution and, and, and in some cases also ecosystem services. So can, can, help, can help to deliver and communicate to the public that the, the benefits of, of, the, of, of the transition. Anyone else want to respond to that? Or shall I pull another question in? I can maybe just quickly um, say that What's important is really to have some, uh, somewhat a longer term perspective in terms of what is needed to get to these near zero emissions societies. So what's a, what, what really is a, um, is a risk to focus on measures that deliver like 20% emission reductions, for example, by switching from coal to gas in power supply, but that really prevent the system from going to near zero. Um, and this is, this is important to keep in mind. And that's why from our perspective, it's very, very important to have like these longer-term perspectives for the planning of short-term policies, avoiding lock-ins, uh, really triggering the transitions that enable societies to go to near zero over the, let's say, 30, 40, 50 year time horizon. Another question from the audience. Hello, my name is Eric. I'm a student of uh, political science and uh, I believe in politics, of course. Um, where are the politicians today for the people organizing this? And uh, how important is their role in this transition? And how do you feel that you're met with uh, whatever you present for them? The invited st uh, state secretary is sick in bed. But, um, <laughs> uh, or maybe she didn't want to answer your questions. Um, but it's a broader question, isn't it? Who would like to respond to this? I can respond. Um, I think the politicians have done a tremendous job with getting the cost down for renewable. But as I said in my presentation, we now need to attack the more difficult or the harder parts of the energy segments uh, and look at how we can decarbonize that. Uh, so I would encourage politicians to think about that, educate themselves. Uh, and as I alluded to again in my presentation, carbon capture and storage is uh, a solution that I think needs to be part of the end game. I'm not saying it's the ultimate solution, but it needs to be part there. So it's very expensive, right, Irena? It is and expensive is the Norwegian today. government going to put the money in to make it, make it a, a viable option, the way the Danish government put all that money into wind whenever it was 15, 20 years ago, and China has put absolute avalanches of money into solar and wind. Mm. Is no, no, the Norwegian government going to make CCS a reality? We are at least working every day under the assumption that they will. Uh, so we have a large team uh, working on the storage and transportation part of this project and uh, uh, have a good dialogue with the uh, authorities and um, believe that they will support it. Uh, so they haven't actually said that they will? Because you made an announcement about six months ago, right, for this big the CCS project that you to showed us about on your well, slide, I, moving stuff across into the North Sea and all that. Hmm. And, 
Uh, what they have said is that they are willing to, to go into a, a study phase and we have some agreements with them on that. Then for the full-scale development, they want to make sure, um, and this is after the Norwegian election, where there is a minority government, they've said they want to run it through the parliament to make sure they have cross-party uh, support. So that's the process, as far as I understand it, that they'll run it through the parliament, uh, get that uh, cross-party support, and, and then we'll go ahead, and this will happen sometime uh, this summer. Right. Mm. So there's a question mark over it. Mm. Yeah. But I, th I think Norway has a job to play here, but I think there's clearly other. Uh, I go to the UK very, very often. Uh, they've got a very intriguing climate and energy minister over there who's a big supporter of carbon capture and storage. Uh, we're seeing a renewed interest because I, c I think it comes with the acknowledgement that uh, you're alluding to solar and wind are not going to solve uh, all the issues. Yeah, but you can't rely on the UK to do anything meaningful in this. Because the UK has got other issues on its mind. We would all like to know what the government is thinking on the big, the big issue on, that faces the country. So which, which country is going to do this? Which country, apart from China again, is going to throw shed loads of money into new technologies and making them happen? Is, do we know? Has anyone got any ideas? There's resounding silence in the room. Volker. Um, my hunch is, I mean, politicians are obviously central, and um, it is particularly important to have politicians with a long-term vision of um, where, yeah, where countries should, um, should develop. And this is really about managing the transition. There, there will obviously be um, yeah, many benefits, but there will also be hard decisions to be made. I mean, we will have to contract some industries that are very carbon intensive, and doing that in a way that is particularly socially acceptable is important. I mean, if you look at if, of examples of, of industries that, that have been closed down, coal mining in Germany, for instance, took roughly 40, 45 years since the mid-70s to, uh, to be phased out now, hard coal mining, that is. Um, and I mean, there are millions and millions of miners in, in China, in India, in, in other countries. And so it, it really requires a long-term vision for the transition that, um, yeah, that is inclusive and that doesn't leave those behind that, um, that see their jobs put at risk um, due to the transformation to a more low-carbon society. Yeah, so it's very, very painful. Um, so this is a discussion that could go on and on and on. We've barely begun it, really. And I'm going to invite you all to continue the discussion over lunch while dipping into the, um, the competition submissions. Um, should we put one last question, very, very, very short question, to our, our panelists about... Is it possible? No, this is too journalistic, really. I was going to say, give me one thing, one thing that has to be in the mix without which, I mean, we, I've learned it has to be a mix, okay? There's no one answer. But what, what is going to be in that mix? What, can I put you on the spot? Tell me one thing that we need to have in order to have the faintest hope of getting to two degrees? Terrible question. Leave. Oh, I think it, uh, it, it's CCS, really. I mean, uh, there is uh, many energy sources. There's uh, no silver bullet. CCS, okay. CCS. Who else has got an instant journalistic answer for me? Francesco. Carbon taxes. Carbon taxes. I thought he was going to say biomass. Okay. <laughs> Carbon taxes. Okay. And that's another, you know, maybe fantasy. No, maybe not. Volca, Irena. Energy efficiency. Energy efficiency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we haven't talked about nearly enough. I also do think there's, uh, it might not be the most important issue, but it's one that we haven't discussed. It's demand management. Uh, we talked about lifestyle changes. Obviously, you know, we would like to encourage that and believe that that could happen. But there's something about, you know, changing the pattern of when you use uh, your energy as well that can have a tremendous yep. impact. Uh, yeah, demand management. Because right now we're all building our energy systems for peak demand because everyone is watching TV in the evening. And, and if we only can start charging our cars when we're at work rather than during the night, that will really ease um, at least sometime into the future, uh, some of the challenges that we're, we're looking at. Thank you. So that leaves you, Gunnar. 
Yeah, so um, I go with comprehensive carbon pricing. It's really mm. the single most important price really that we cover all sectors, all regions. I don't say that carbon pricing is the only and, and unique solution, but certainly the most effective one. And it will need to be a central element of any climate policy approach. Very interesting. What do you think? So we have two, the two things that have come up twice, this carbon, carbon pricing. So what does the room think? How important is it actually remotely likely to happen in our lifetimes or by the end of the century in any meaningful way? How about a yes, if you agree? There's one lone hand over there. Well, Peter Sor has his <laughs> hand up, a very brave soul. And, and we have Professor Williams, who started off our discussion. Okay. Who's also, do you want to have a final word before we all? Uh, I, well, I, I think that the, the carbon price can be a proxy for many things. Mm -hmm. And we have saw in some of the presentations that there's a lot of drivers, for instance, clean air, uh, and that you can then put in place policies such as a gasoline tax, which are effectively a carbon price. So more broadly writ, we can think of the carbon price as a way of drawing a whole bunch of different social issues in. And I would add just finally at the end that the most important thing is social acceptance uh, of the idea that we actually have to deal with this problem. Because if we don't have that, nothing will happen. Very wise words. Thank you very much. Shall we say a big thank you to our panelists? Um,